Act Three of Arms and the Man by George Bernard Shaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Act Three. In the library after lunch. It is not much of a library. Its literary equipment consisting of a single fixed shelf stocked with old paper-covered novels, broken-backed, coffee-stained, torn and thumbed, and a couple of little hanging shelves with a few gift books on them, the rest of the wall space being occupied by trophies of war and the chase. But it is a most comfortable sitting-room. A row of three large windows in the front of the house show a mountain panorama which is just now seen in one of its softest aspects in the mellowing afternoon light. In the left-hand corner, a square earthenware stove, a perfect tower of colored pottery, rises nearly to the ceiling and guarantees plenty of warmth. The ottoman in the middle is a circular bank of decorated cushions, and the window seats are well upholstered divans. Little Turkish tables, one of them with an elaborate hookah on it and a screen to match them, complete the handsome effect of the furnishing. There is one object, however, which is hopelessly out of keeping with its surroundings. This is a small kitchen table, much the worse for wear, fitted as a writing table with an old canister full of pins, an egg cup filled with ink, and a deplorable scrap of severely used pink blotting paper. At the side of this table, which stands on the right, Bluntschli is hard at work, with a couple of maps before him, writing orders. At the head of it sits Sergius, who is also supposed to be at work, but who is actually gnawing the feather of a pin, and contemplating Bluntschli's quick, sure, business-like progress, with a mixture of envious irritation at his own incapacity, and awestruck wonder at an ability which seems to him almost miraculous though its prosaic character forbids him to esteem it. The Major is comfortably established on the ottoman, with a newspaper in his hand, and the tube of the hookah within his reach. Catherine sits at the stove, with her back to them, embroidering. Raina, reclining on the divan under the left-hand window, is gazing in a daydream out at the Balkan landscape, with a neglected novel in her lap. The door is on the left, the button of the electric bell is between the door and the fireplace. Petkoff, looking up from his paper to watch how they are getting on at the table, Are you sure I can't help you in any way, Blunchley? Blunchley, without interrupting his writing or looking up, Quite sure, thank you. Saranoff and I will manage it. Sergius, grimly, Yes, we'll manage it. He finds out what to do, draws up the orders, and I sign them. Division of labor, Major. Blunchley passes him a paper. Another one? Thank you. He plants the paper squarely before him, sets his chair carefully parallel to them, and signs with the air of a man resolutely performing a difficult and dangerous feat. This hand is more accustomed to the sword than to the pen. Petkoff. It's very good of you, Blunchley. It is indeed to let yourself be put upon in this way. Are you quite sure I can do nothing? Catherine, in a low warning tone, You can stop interrupting, Paul. Petkoff, starting and looking round at her, Eh? Oh, quite right, my love, quite right. He takes his newspaper off but lets it drop again. Ah, you haven't been campaigning, Catherine. You don't know how pleasant it is for us to sit here after a good lunch with nothing to do but enjoy ourselves. There's only one thing I want to make me thoroughly comfortable. Catherine, what is that? Petkoff, my old coat. I'm not at home in this one. I feel as if I were on parade. Catherine, my dear Paul, how absurd you are about that old coat. It must be hanging in the blue closet where you left it. Petkoff, my dear Catherine, I tell you, I've looked there. Am I to believe my own eyes or not? Catherine quietly rises and presses the button of the electric bell by the fireplace. What are you showing off that bell for? She looks at him majestically and silently resumes her chair and her needlework. 
my dear if you think the obstinacy of your sex can make a coat out of two old dressing gowns of raina's your waterproof and my mackintosh you're mistaken that's exactly what the blue closet contains at the present nikola presents himself catherine unmoved by petkoff's sally nikola go to the blue closet and bring your master's old coat here the braided one he usually wears in the house nikola yes madam nikola goes out petkoff catherine catherine yes paul petkoff i bet you any piece of jewelry you like to order from sophia against a week's housekeeping money that the coat isn't there catherine done paul petkoff excited by the prospect of a gamble come here's an opportunity for some sport who'll bet on it bluntly i'll give you six to one bluntly imperturbably it would be robbing you major madame is sure to be right without looking up he passes another batch of papers to sergius sergius also excited bravo switzerland major i bet my best charger against an arab mare for raina that nikola finds the coat in the blue closet petkoff eagerly your best ch catherine hastily interrupts him don't be foolish paul an arabian mare will cost you fifty thousand levas raina suddenly coming out of her picturesque reverie really mother if you are going to take the jewelry i don't see why you should grudge me my arab nikola comes back with the coat and brings it to petkoff who can hardly believe his eyes catherine where was it nikola nikola hanging in the blue closet madam petkoff well i am de catherine stopping him paul petkoff i could have sworn it wasn't there age is beginning to tell on me i'm getting hallucinations to nikola here help me change excuse me bluntly he begins changing coats nikola acting as valet remember i didn't take that bet of yours sergius you'd better give raina that arab steed yourself since you've roused her expectations eh raina he looks round at her but she is again wrapped in the landscape with a little gush of paternal affection and pride he points her out to them and says she's dreaming as usual sergius assuredly she shall not be the loser petkoff so much the better for her i shan't come off so cheap i expect change is now complete nikola goes out with the discarded coat ah now i feel at home at last he sits down and takes his newspaper with a grunt of relief bluntly to sergius handing a paper that's the last order petkoff jumping up what finished bluntly finished petkoff goes beside sergius looks curiously over his left shoulder as he signs and says with childlike envy haven't you anything for me to sign bluntly not necessary his signature will do petkoff ah well i think we've done a thundering good day's work he goes away from the table can i do anything more bluntly you had better both see the fellows that are to take these to sergius pack them off at once and show them that i've marked on the orders the time they should hand them in by tell them that if they stop to drink or tell stories if they're five minutes late they'll have the skin taken off their backs sergius rising indignantly i'll say so and if one of them is man enough to spit in my face for insulting him i'll buy his discharge and give him a pension he strides out his humanity deeply outraged bluntly confidentially just see that he talks to them properly major will you petkoff officiously quite right bluntly quite right i'll see to it he goes to the door importantly but hesitates on the threshold by the by catherine you may come as well too they'll be far more frightened of you than of me catherine putting down her embroidery i dare say i had better 
you will only splutter at them she goes out petkoff holding the door for her and following her bluntly what a country they make cannons out of cherry trees and the officers send for their wives to keep discipline he begins to fold and docket the papers raina who has risen from the divan strolls down the room with her hands clasped behind her and looks mischievously at him raina you look ever so much nicer than when we last met he looks up surprised what have you done to yourself bluntly washed brushed good night sleep and breakfast that's all raina did you get back safely that morning bluntly quite thanks raina were they angry with you for running away from sergius's charge bluntly no they were glad because they'd all just run away themselves raina going to the table and leaning over it toward him it must have made a lovely story for them all that about me and my room bluntly capital story but i only told it to one of them a particular friend raina on whose discretion you could absolutely rely bluntly absolutely raina huh he told it to my father and sergius the day you exchanged the prisoners she turned away and strolls carelessly across to the other side of the room bluntly deeply concerned and half incredulous no you don't mean that do you raina turning with sudden eagerness i do indeed but they don't know that it was in this house that you hid if sergius knew he would challenge you and kill you in a duel bluntly bless me then don't tell him raina full of reproach for his levity can you realize what it is to me to deceive him i want to be quite perfect with sergius no meanness no smallness no deceit my relation to him is the one really beautiful and noble part of my life i hope you can understand that bluntly skeptically you mean that you wouldn't like him to find out that the story about the ice pudding was a a a you know raina wincing ah don't talk of it in that flippant way i lied i know it but i did it to save your life he would have killed you that was the second time i ever uttered a falsehood bluntly rises quickly and looks doubtfully and somewhat severely at her do you remember the first time bluntly i no was i present raina yes and i told the officer who was searching for you that you were not present bluntly true i should have remembered it raina greatly encouraged ah it is natural that you should forget it first it cost you nothing it cost me a lie a lie she sits down on the ottoman looking straight before her with her hands clasped on her knee bluntly quite touched goes to the ottoman with a particularly reassuring and considerate air and sits down beside her bluntly my dear young lady don't let this worry you remember i'm a soldier now what are the two things that happen to a soldier so often that he comes to think nothing of them one is hearing people tell lies raina recoils the other is getting his life saved in all sorts of ways by all sorts of people raina rising in indignant protest and so he becomes a creature incapable of faith and of gratitude bluntly making a wry face do you like gratitude i don't if pity is akin to love gratitude is akin to the other thing raina gratitude turning to him if you are incapable of gratitude you are incapable of any noble sentiment even animals are grateful oh i see now exactly what you think of me you were not surprised to hear me lie to you it was something i probably did every day every hour that is how men think of women she walks up the room melodramatically bluntly dubiously there's reason in everything you said you told only two lies in your whole life dear young lady 
isn't that rather a short allowance i'm quite a straightforward man myself but it wouldn't last me a whole morning raina staring haughtily at him do you know sir that you are insulting me bluntly i can't help it when you get into that noble attitude and speak with that thrilling voice i admire you but i find it impossible to believe a single word you say raina superbly captain bluntly bluntly unmoved yes raina coming a little towards him as if she could not believe her senses do you mean what you said just now do you know what you said just now bluntly i do raina gasping i i she points to herself incredulously meaning i raina petkoff tell lies he meets her gaze unflinchingly she suddenly sits down beside him and adds with a complete change of manner from the heroic to the familiar how did you find me out bluntly promptly instinct dear young lady instinct and experience of the world raina wonderingly do you know you are the first man i ever met who did not take me seriously bluntly you mean don't you that i am the first man that has ever taken you quite seriously raina yes i suppose i do mean that cozily quite at her ease with him how strange it is to be talked to in such a way you know i've always gone on like that i mean the noble attitude and the thrilling voice i did it when i was a tiny child to my nurse she believed in it i do it before my parents they believe in it i do it before sergius he believes in it bluntly yes he's a little in that line himself isn't he raina startled do you think so bluntly you know him better than i do raina i wonder i wonder is he if i thought that discouraged ah oh, well what does it matter i suppose now that you found me out you despise me bluntly warmly rising no my dear young lady no 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 a thousand times it's part of your youth part of your charm i'm like all the rest of them the nurse your parents sergius i'm your infatuated admirer raina pleased really bluntly slapping his breast smartly with his hand german fashion hand of hertz really and truly raina very happy but what did you think of me for giving you my portrait bluntly astonished your portrait you never gave me your portrait raina quickly do you mean to say you never got it bluntly no he sits down beside her with renewed interest and says with some complacency when did you send it to me raina indignantly i did not send it to you she turns her head away and adds reluctantly it was in the pocket of that coat bluntly pursing his lips and rounding his eyes oh i never found it it must be there still raina springing up there still for my father to find the first time he puts his hand in his pocket oh how could you be so stupid bluntly rising also it doesn't matter it's only a photograph how can he tell who it was intended for tell him he put it there himself raina impatiently yes that is so clever so clever what shall i do bluntly ah i see you wrote something on it that was rash raina annoyed almost to tears oh to have done such a thing for you who care no more except to laugh at me oh are you sure nobody has touched it bluntly well i can't be quite sure you see i couldn't carry it about with me all the time one can't take much luggage on active service raina what did you do with it bluntly when i got through to pirot 
I had to put it in safekeeping somehow. I thought of the railway cloakroom, but that's the surest place to get looted in modern warfare. So I pawned it. Raina. Pawned it? Blenchley. I know it doesn't sound nice, but it was much the safest plan. I redeemed it the day before yesterday. Heaven only knows whether the pawnbroker cleared out the pockets or not. Raina, furious, throwing the words right into his face. You have a low shopkeeping mind. You think of things that would never come into a gentleman's head. Blenchley, phlegmatically. That's the Swiss national character, dear lady. Raina, oh, I wish I had never met you. She flounces away and sits at the window, fuming. Luca comes in with a heap of letters and telegrams on her salver and crosses with her bold free gait to the table. Her left sleeve is looped up to the shoulder with a brooch showing her naked arm with a broad gilt bracelet covering the bruise. Luca, too blunchly, for you. She empties the salver recklessly on the table. The messenger is waiting. She is determined not to be civil to a Servian, even if she must bring him his letters. Blanchley to Rania, will you excuse me? The last postal delivery that reached me was three weeks ago. These are the subsequent accumulations. Four telegrams a week old. He opens one. Oh, ho, bad news. Raina, rising and advancing a little remorsefully. Bad news? Blanchley, my father's dead. He looks at the telegram with his lips pursed, musing on the unexpected change in his arrangements. Raina, oh, how very sad. Blanchley, yes, I shall have to start for home in an hour. He has left a lot of big hotels behind him to be looked after. Takes up a heavy letter in a long blue envelope. Here's a whacking letter from the family solicitor. He pulls out the enclosures and glances over them. Great heavens! Seventy! Two hundred! In a crescendo of dismay. Four hundred! Four thousand! Nine thousand six hundred! What on earth shall I do with them all? Raina, timidly. Nine thousand hotels? Blunchly. Hotels? Nonsense. If you only knew... Oh, it's too ridiculous. Excuse me. I must give my fellow orders about starting. He leaves the room hastily with the documents in his hand. Luca, tauntingly, he has not much heart, that Swiss, though he is so fond of the Servians. He has not a word of grief for his poor father. Raina, bitterly, grief? A man who has been doing nothing but killing people for years? What does he care? What does any soldier care? She goes to the door, evidently restraining her tears with difficulty. Luca. Major Saranoff has been fighting, too, and he has plenty of heart left. Raina, at the door, looks haughtily at her and goes out. Aha! I thought you wouldn't get much feeling out of your soldier. She is following Raina when Nicola comes with an armful of logs for the fire. Nicola, grinning amorously at her. I've been trying all the afternoon to get a minute alone with you, my girl. His countenance changes as he notices her arm. Why, what fashion is that of wearing your sleeve, child? Luca, proudly, my own fashion. Nicola, indeed. If the mistress catches you, she'll talk to you. He throws the logs down on the ottoman and sits comfortably beside them. Luca, is that any reason why you should take it on yourself to talk to me? Nicola. Come, don't be so contrary with me. I've some good news for you. He takes out some paper money. Luca, with an eager gleam in her eyes, comes close to look at it. See, a twenty liva bill. Sergius gave me that out of pure swagger. A fool and his money are soon parted. There's ten livas more. The Swiss gave me that for backing up the mistresses and Raina's lies about him. He's no fool, he isn't. 
you should have heard old Catherine downstairs as polite as you please to me, telling me not to mind the major being a little impatient, for they knew what a good servant I was, after making a fool and a liar of me before them all. The twenty will go to our savings, and you shall have the ten to spend if you'll only talk to me so as to remind me I'm a human being. I get tired of being a servant occasionally. Luca scornfully yes sell your manhood for thirty levas and buy me for ten keep your money you were born to be a servant i was not when you set up your shop you will only be everybody's servant instead of somebody's servant nicola picking up his logs and going to the stove ah wait till you see we shall have our evenings to ourselves, and I shall be master in my own house, I promise you. He throws the logs down and kneels at the stove. Luca, you shall never be master in mine. She sits down on Sergius's chair. Nicola, turning, still on his knees, and squatting down rather forlornly on his calves, daunted by her implacable disdain. You have a great ambition in you, Luca. Remember, if any luck comes to you, it was I that made a woman of you. Luca. You? Nicola, with dogged self-assertion. Yes, me. Who was it made you give up wearing a couple of pounds of false black hair on your head and reddening your lips and cheeks like any other Bulgarian girl? I did. Who taught you to trim your nails and keep your hands clean and be dainty about yourself like a fine Russian lady? Me! Do you hear that? Me! She tosses her head defiantly, and he rises, ill-humouredly, adding more coolly, I've often thought that if Raina were out of the way, and you just a little less of a fool, and Sergius just a little more of one, you might come to be one of my grandest customers instead of only being my wife and costing me money luca i believe you would rather be my servant than my husband you would make more out of me oh i know that soul of yours nicola going up close to her for greater emphasis never you mind my soul but just listen to my advice if you want to be a lady your present behavior to me won't do at all, unless when we're alone. It's too sharp and impudent. And impudence is a sort of familiarity. It shows affection for me. And don't you try being high and mighty with me, either. You're like all country girls. You think it's genteel to treat a servant the way I treat a stable boy. That's only your ignorance, and don't you forget it. Don't be so ready to defy everybody. Act as if you expected to have your own way, not as if you expected to be ordered about. The way to get on as a lady is the same as the way to get on as a servant. You've got to know your place. That's the secret of it. And you may depend on me to know my place if you get promoted. Think it over, my girl. I'll stand by you. One servant should always stand by another. Luca, rising impatiently, oh, I must behave in my own way. You take all the courage out of me with your cold-blooded wisdom. Go and put those logs on the fire. That's the sort of thing you understand. Before Nicola can retort, Sergius comes in. He checks himself a moment on seeing Luca, then goes to the stove. Sergius to Nicola, I am not in the way of your work, I hope. Nicola, in a smooth, elderly manner. Oh, no, sir, thank you kindly. I was only speaking to this foolish girl about her habit of running up here to the library whenever she gets a chance to look at the books. That's the worst of her education, sir. It gives her habits above her station. To Luca. Make that table tidy, Luca, for the major. He goes out sedately. Luca, without looking at Sergius, begins to arrange the papers on the table. He crosses slowly to her and studies the arrangement of her sleeve reflectively. Sergius, let me see. Is there a mark there? He turns up the bracelet and sees the bruise made by his grasp. She stands motionless, not looking at him, fascinated but on her guard. Whew, does it hurt? 
Luca. Yes. Sergius. Shall I cure it? Luca, instantly withdrawing herself proudly, but still not looking at him. No, you cannot cure it now. Sergius, masterfully. Quite sure? He makes a movement as if to take her in his arms. Luca, don't trifle with me, please. An officer should not trifle with a servant. Sergius, touching the arm with a merciless stroke of his forefinger. That was no trifle, Luca. Luca, no, looking at him for the first time. Are you sorry? Sergius, with measured emphasis, folding his arms. I am never sorry. Luca, wistfully. I wish I could believe a man could be so unlike a woman as that. I wonder, are you really a brave man? Sergius, unaffectedly, relaxing his attitude. Yes, I am a brave man. My heart jumped like a woman's at the first shot. But in the charge I found that I was brave. Yes, that at least is real about me. Luca. Did you find in the charge that the men whose fathers are poor like mine were any less brave than the men who are rich like you? Sergius, with bitter levity, not a bit. They all slashed and cursed and yelled like heroes. Pshaw! The courage to rage and kill is cheap. I have an English bull terrier who has as much of that sort of courage as the whole Bulgarian nation and the whole Russian nation at its back. But he lets my groom thrash him all the same. That's your soldier all over. No, Luca, your poor men can cut throats, but they are afraid of their officers. They put up with insults and blows. They stand by and see one another punished like children. Aye, and help to do it when they are ordered. And the officers, well, with a short bitter laugh, <laughs> I am an officer. Oh, fervently. Give me the man who will defy to the death any power on earth or in heaven that sets itself up against his own will and conscience. He alone is the brave man. Luca, how easy it is to talk. Men never seem to me to grow up. They all have schoolboys' ideas. You don't know what true courage is. Sergius, ironically, indeed, I am willing to be instructed. Luca, look at me. How much am I allowed to have my own will? I have to get your room ready for you, to sweep and dust, to fetch and carry. How could that degrade me if it did not degrade you to have it done for you? But, with subdued passion, if I were Empress of Russia above every one in the world, then, ah, then, though according to you I could show no courage at all, you should see you should see sergius what would you do most noble empress luca i would marry the man i loved which no other queen in europe has the courage to do if i loved you though you would be as far beneath me as i am beneath you i would dare to be the equal of my inferior would you dare as much if you loved me no if you felt the beginnings of love for me, you would not let it grow. You dare not. You would marry a rich man's daughter because you would be afraid of what other people would say of you. Sergius carried away. You lie. It is not so by all the stars. If I loved you and I were the Tsar of Russia himself, I would set you on the throne by my side. You know that I love another woman. A woman as high above you as heaven is above earth, and you are jealous of her. Luca, I have no reason to be. She will never marry you now. The man I told you of has come back. She will marry the Swiss. Sergius, recoiling. The Swiss? Luca, a man worth ten of you. Then you can come to me, and I will refuse you. You are not good enough for me. She turns to the door. Sergius springing after her and catching her fiercely in his arms. I will kill the Swiss, and afterwards I will do as I please with you. 
Luca, in his arms, passive and steadfast. The Swiss will kill you, perhaps. He has beaten you in love. He may beat you in war. Sergius, tormentedly. Do you think I believe that she, she, whose worst thoughts are higher than your best ones, is capable of trifling with another man behind my back? Luca, do you think she would believe the Swiss if he told her now that I am in your arms? Sergius, releasing her in despair. Damnation! Oh, damnation! Mockery! Mockery everywhere! Everything I think is mocked by everything I do. He strikes himself frantically on the breast. Coward! Liar! Fool! Shall I kill myself like a man? or live and pretend to laugh at myself she again turns to go luca she stops near the door remember you belong to me luca quietly what does that mean an insult sergius commandingly it means that you love me and that i have had you here in my arms and will perhaps have you there again whether that is an insult i neither know nor care take it as you please but vehemently i will not be a coward and a trifler if i choose to love you i dare marry you in spite of all bulgaria if these hands ever touch you again they shall touch my affianced bride luca we shall see whether you dare keep your word but take care i will not wait long Sergius, again folding his arms and standing motionless in the middle of the room. Yes, we shall see, and you shall wait my pleasure. Blunchley, much preoccupied, with his paper still in his hand, enters, leaving the door open for Luca to go out. He goes across to the table, glancing at her as he passes. Sergius, without altering his resolute attitude, watches him steadily. Luca goes out, leaving the door open. Blunchley, absently sitting at the table as before and putting down his papers. That's a remarkable-looking young woman. Sergius, gravely, without moving. Captain Blunchley? Blunchley, eh? Sergius, you have deceived me. You are my rival. I brook no rivals. At six o'clock I shall be in the drilling ground on the Clisora Road, alone, on horseback with my saber do you understand Blunchley, staring but sitting quite at his ease oh thank you that's a cavalry man's proposal i'm in the artillery and i have the choice of weapons if i go i shall take a machine gun and there shall be no mistake about the cartridges this time sergius flushing but with deadly coldness take care sir it is not our custom in bulgaria to allow invitations of that kind to be trifled with Blunchley warmly Pooh, don't talk to me about bulgaria you don't know what fighting is but have it your own way bring your saber along i'll meet you sergius fiercely delighted to find his opponent a man of spirit well said switzer shall i lend you my best horse Blunchley no damn your horse thank you all the same my dear fellow raina comes in and hears the next sentence i shall fight you on foot horseback's too dangerous i don't want to kill you if i can help it raina hurrying forward anxiously i have heard what captain blenchley said sergius you are going to fight why sergius turns away in silence and goes to the stove where he stands watching her as she continues to blenchley what about Blunchley? i don't know he hasn't told me better not interfere dear young lady no harm will be done i've often acted as sword instructor he won't be able to touch me and i'll not hurt him it will save explanations in the morning i shall be off home and you'll never see me or hear of me again you and he will then make it up and live happily ever after raina turning away deeply hurt almost with a sob in her voice i never said i wanted to see you again sergius striding forward ha that is a confession 
Raina, haughtily, what do you mean? Sergius, you love that man. Raina, scandalized, Sergius. Sergius, you allow him to make love to you behind my back just as you accept me as your affianced husband behind his. Blanchley, you knew our relations, and you deceived me. It is for that that I call you to account, not for having received favors that I never enjoyed. Blanchley, jumping up indignantly, Stuff! Rubbish! I have received no favors! Why, the young lady doesn't even know whether I'm married or not. Raina, forgetting herself, Oh! Collapsing on the ottoman. Are you? Sergius, you see the young lady's concern, Captain Blunchley. Denial is useless. You have enjoyed the privilege of being received in her own room late at night, Blunchley, interrupting him pepperily. Yes, you blockhead. She received me with a pistol at her head. Your cavalry were at my heels. I'd have blown out her brains if she'd uttered a cry. Sergius taken aback blunchley raina is this true raina rising in wrathful majesty oh how dare you how dare you blunchley apologize man apologize he resumes his seat at the table sergius with the old measured emphasis folding his arms i never apologize raina passionately this is the doing of that friend of yours captain blenchley it is he who is spreading this horrible story about me she walks about excitedly blenchley no he's dead burnt alive raina stopping shocked burnt alive blenchley shot in the hip in a woodyard couldn't drag himself out your fellow's shells set the timber on fire and burnt him with half a dozen other poor devils in the same predicament. Raina, how horrible! Sergius, and how ridiculous! A war, war, the dream of patriots and heroes. A fraud, Blenchley, a hollow sham, like love. Raina, outraged, like love? You say that before me? Blenchley, Come, Saranov, that matter is explained. Sergius, a hollow sham, I say. Would you have come back here if nothing had passed between you except at the muzzle of your pistol? Raina is mistaken about our friend who was burnt. He was not my informant. Raina, who then? Suddenly guessing the truth. Ah, Luca, my maid, my servant. You were with her this morning all that time after, after. Oh, what sort of god is this I have been worshipping? He meets her gaze with sardonic enjoyment of her disenchantment. Angered all the more, she goes closer to him and says in a lower, intenser tone, do you know that I looked out of the window as I went upstairs to have another sight of my hero, and I saw something that I did not understand then? I know now that you were making love to her. Sergius, with grim humor, you saw that? Raina, only too well. She turns away and throws herself on the divan under the center window, quite overcome. Sergius cynically Raina, our romance is shattered. Life's a force. Blunchley to Raina good humouredly. You see, he's found himself out now. Sergius Blunchley, I have allowed you to call me a blockhead. You may now call me a coward as well. I refuse to fight you. Do you know why? Blunchley, no, but it doesn't matter. I didn't ask the reason when you cried on, and I don't ask the reason now that you cry off. I'm a professional soldier. I fight when I have to, and am very glad to get out of it when I haven't to. You're only an amateur. You think fighting's an amusement. Sergius, you shall hear the reason all the same, my professional. The reason is that it takes two men, real men, men of heart, blood, and honor, 
to make a genuine combat. I could no more fight with you than I could make love to an ugly woman. You've no magnetism. You're not a man, you're a machine. Bluntly, apologetically. Quite true, quite true. I always was that sort of chap. I'm very sorry. But now that you've found that life isn't a farce, but something quite sensible and serious, what further obstacle is there to your happiness? Raina, riling. You are very solicitous about my happiness and his. Do you forget his new love, Luca? It is not you that he must fight now, but his rival, Nicola. Sergius. Rival? Striking his forehead. Raina. Did you not know that they are engaged? Sergius. Nicola? Are fresh abysses opening? Nicola. Raina. Sarcastically. A shocking sacrifice, isn't it? Such beauty, such intellect, such modesty, wasted on a middle-aged servant man. Really, Sergius, you cannot stand by and allow such a thing. It would be unworthy of your chivalry. Sergius, losing all self-control. Viper, viper! He rushes to and fro, raging. Blenchley, look here, Saranoff, you're getting the worst of this. Raina, getting angrier. Do you realize what he has done, Captain Blenchley? He has set this girl as a spy on us, and her reward is that he makes love to her. Sergius, false, monstrous. Raina, monstrous, confronting him. Do you deny that she told you about Captain Blenchley being in my room? Sergius, no, but... Raina, interrupting. Do you deny that you were making love to her when she told you? Sergius, no, but I tell you... Raina, cutting him short contemptuously, it is unnecessary to tell us anything more. That is quite enough for us. She turns her back on him and sweeps majestically back to the window. Blunchly, quietly as Sergius in an agony of mortification sinks on the ottoman, clutching his averted head between his fists. I told you you were getting the worst of it, Saranoff. Sergius, tiger cat. Raina, running excitedly to Blunchley. You hear this man calling me names, Captain Blunchley? Blunchley, what else can he do, dear lady? He must defend himself somehow. Come, very persuasively, don't quarrel. What good does it do? Raina, with a gasp, sits down on the ottoman, and after a vain effort to look vexedly at Blunchley, she falls a victim to her own sense of humor and is attacked with a disposition to laugh. Sergius, engaged to Nicola. He rises. Ha, <laughs> ha. Going to the stove and standing with his back to it. Ah, well, Blunchley, you are right to take this huge imposture of a world coolly. Raina, to Blunchley with an intuitive guess at his state of mind, I dare say you think us a couple of grown-up babies, don't you? Sergius, grinning a little, he does, he does. Swiss civilization, nurse-tending Bulgarian barbarism, eh? Blunchley, blushing, not at all, I assure you. I'm only very glad to get you too quieted. There now, let's be pleasant and talk it over in a friendly way. Where is this other young lady? Raina. Listening at the door, probably. Sergius, shivering as if a bullet has struck him, and speaking with quiet but deep indignation. I will prove that that at least is a calumny. He goes with dignity to the door and opens it. A yell of fury bursts from him as he looks out. He darts into the passage and returns, dragging in Luca, whom he flings against the table, right as he cries, Judge her, Blunchley. You, the moderate, cautious man, judge the eavesdropper. Luca stands her ground, proud and silent. Blunchley, shaking his head, I mustn't judge her. I once listened myself outside a tent when there was a mutiny brewing. It's all a question of the degree of provocation. My life was at stake. Luca. 
my love was at stake sergius flinches ashamed of her in spite of himself i am not ashamed raina contemptuously your love your curiosity you mean luca facing her and retorting her contempt with interest my love stronger than anything you can feel even for your chocolate cream soldier sergius with quick suspicion to luca what does that mean luca fiercely it means sergius interrupting her slightly oh i remember the ice pudding a paltry taunt girl major petkoff enters in his shirt sleeves petkoff excuse my shirt sleeves gentlemen rain somebody has been wearing this coat of mine i'll swear it somebody with bigger shoulders than mine it's all burst open at the back your mother is mending it i wish she'd make haste i shall catch cold he looks more attentively at them is anything the matter raina no she sits down at the stove with a tranquil air sergius oh no he sits down at the end of the table as at first bluntly who is already seated nothing nothing petkoff sitting down on the ottoman in its old place that's all right he notices luca anything the matter luca luca no sir petkoff genially that's all right he sneezes go and ask your mistress for my coat like a good girl will you she turns to obey but nikolai enters with the coat and she makes a pretense of having business in the room by taking the little table with the hookah away to the wall near the windows raina rising quickly as she sees the coat on nikola's arm here it is papa give it to me nikola and do you put some more wood on the fire she takes the coat and brings it to the major who stands up to put it on nikola attends to the fire petkoff to raina teasing her affectionately aha going to be very good to poor old papa just for one day after his return from the wars eh raina with solemn reproach ah how can you say that to me father petkoff well well only a joke little one come give me a kiss she kisses him now give me the coat raina now i am going to put it on for you turn your back he turns his back and feels behind him with his arms for the sleeves she dexterously takes the photograph from the pocket and throws it on the table before bluntschli who covers it with the sheet of paper under the very nose of sergius who looks on amazed with his suspicions roused in the highest degree she then helps petkoff on with his coat there dear now are you comfortable petkoff quite little love thanks he sits down and raina returns to her seat near the stove oh by the by i've found something funny what's the meaning of this he puts his hand into the picked pocket eh hello he tries the other pocket well i could have sworn much puzzled he tries the breast pocket i wonder tries the original pocket where can it a light flashes on him he rises exclaiming your mother's taken it raina very red taken what petkoff your photograph with the inscription raina to her chocolate cream soldier a souvenir now you know there's something more in this than meets the eye and i'm going to find it out shouting nikola nikola dropping a log and turning sir petkoff did you spoil any pastry of miss raina's this morning nikola you heard miss raina say that i did sir petkoff i know that you idiot was it true nikola i am sure miss raina is incapable of saying anything that is not true sir petkoff are you then i'm not turning to the others come do you think i don't see it all goes to sergius and slaps him on the shoulder sergius you're the chocolate cream soldier aren't you sergius standing up i a chocolate cream soldier certainly not petkoff not he looks at them they are all very serious and very conscious 
Do you mean to tell me that Raina sends photographic souvenirs to other men? Sergius, enigmatically, the world is not such an innocent place as we used to think, Petkoff. Bletchley, rising, it's all right, Major. I'm the chocolate cream soldier. Petkoff and Sergius are equally astonished. The gracious young lady saved my life by giving me chocolate creams when I was starving. Shall I ever forget their flavor? My late friend Stoles told you the story at Pirot. I was the fugitive. Petkoff. You? He gasps. Sergius, do you remember how those two women went on this morning when we mentioned it? Sergius smiles cynically. Petkoff confronts Rania severely. You're a nice young woman, aren't you? Raina bitterly. Major Saranov has changed his mind. And when I wrote that on the photograph, I did not know that Captain Blunchley was married. Blunchley, much startled, protesting vehemently, I'm not married. Raina with deep reproach. You said you were. Blunchley, I did not. I positively did not. I never was married in my life. Petkoff exasperated. Raina, will you kindly inform me, if I am not asking too much, which gentleman you are engaged to? Raina, to neither of them. This young lady, introducing Luca, who faces them all proudly, is the object of Major Saranov's affections at present. Petkoff, Luca? Are you mad, Sergius? Why, this girl's engaged to Nicola. Nicola coming forward. I beg your pardon, sir. There is a mistake. Luca is not engaged to me. Petkoff. Not engaged to you, you scoundrel? Why, you had twenty-five levas from me on the day of your betrothal, and she had that gilt bracelet from Miss Raina. Nicola, with cool unction, we gave it out so, sir, but it was only to give Luca protection. She had a soul above her station, and I have been no more than her confidential servant. I intend, as you know, sir, to set up a shop later on in Sophia, and I look forward to her custom and recommendation should she marry into the nobility. He goes out with impressive discretion, leaving them all staring after him. Petkoff breaking the silence well i am um sergius this is either the finest heroism or the most crawling baseness which is it bluntly bluntly never mind whether it's heroism or baseness nicola's the ablest man i've met in bulgaria i'll make him manager of a hotel if he can speak french and german luca suddenly breaking out at sergius I have been insulted by every one here. You set them the example. You owe me an apology. Sergius immediately, like a repeating clock of which the spring has been touched, begins to fold his arms. Blunchley, before he can speak, it's no use. He never apologizes. Luca, not to you, his equal and his enemy. To me, his poor servant, he will not refuse to apologize. Sergius approvingly you are right he bends his knee in his grandest manner forgive me luca i forgive you she timidly gives him her hand which he kisses that touch makes me your affianced wife sergius springing up ah i forgot that luca coldly you can withdraw if you like Sergius, withdraw. Never. You belong to me. He puts his arm about her and draws her to him. Catherine comes in and finds Luca in Sergius's arms, and all the rest gazing at them in bewildered astonishment. Catherine, what does this mean? Sergius releases Luca. Petkoff, well, my dear, it appears that Sergius is going to marry Luca instead of Raina. She is about to break out indignantly at him. He stops her by exclaiming testily, Don't blame me, I've nothing to do with it. He retreats to the stove. Catherine, 
marry luca sergius you are bound by your word to us sergius folding his arms nothing binds me bluntschli much pleased by this piece of common sense saranoff your hand my congratulations these heroics of yours have their practical side after all to luca gracious young lady the best wishes of a good republican he kisses her hand to raina's great disgust catherine threateningly luca you have been telling stories luca i have done raina no harm catherine haughtily raina raina is equally indignant at the liberty luca i have a right to call her raina she calls me luca i told major saranoff she would never marry him if the swiss gentleman came back bluntschli surprised hello luca turning to raina i thought you were fonder of him than of sergius you know best whether i was right bluntschli <laughs> what nonsense i assure you my dear major my dear madame the gracious young lady simply saved my life nothing else she never cared two straws for me why bless my heart and soul look at the young lady and look at me she rich young beautiful with her imagination full of fairy princes and noble natures and cavalry charges and goodness knows what and i a commonplace swiss soldier who hardly knows what a decent life is after fifteen years of barracks and battles a vagabond a man who has spoiled all his chances in life through an incurably romantic disposition a man sergius starting as if a needle had pricked him and interrupting bluntschli in incredulous amazement excuse me bluntschli what did you say had spoiled your chances in life bluntschli promptly an incurably romantic disposition i ran away from home twice when i was a boy i went into the army instead of into my father's business i climbed the balcony of this house when a man of sense would have dived into the nearest cellar i came sneaking back here to have another look at the young lady when any other man of my age would have sent the coat back petkoff my coat bluntschli yes that's the coat i mean would have sent it back and gone quietly home do you suppose i am the sort of fellow a young girl falls in love with why look at our ages i'm thirty-four i don't suppose the young lady is much over seventeen this estimate produces a marked sensation all the rest turning and staring at one another he proceeds innocently all that adventure which was life or death to me was only a schoolgirl's game to her chocolate creams and hide-and-seek here's the proof he takes the photograph from the table now i ask you would a woman who took the affair seriously have sent me this and written on it raina to her chocolate cream soldier a souvenir he exhibits the photograph triumphantly as if it settled the matter beyond all possibility of refutation petkoff that's what i was looking for how the deuce did it get there bluntschli to raina complacently i have put everything right i hope gracious young lady raina in uncontrolled vexation i quite agree with your account of yourself you are a romantic idiot bluntschli is unspeakably taken aback next time i hope you will know the difference between a schoolgirl of seventeen and a woman of twenty-three bluntschli stupefied twenty-three she snaps the photograph contemptuously from his hands tears it across and throws the pieces at his feet sergius with grim enjoyment of bluntschli's discomfiture bluntschli my one last belief is gone your sagacity is a fraud like all the other things you have less sense than even i have bluntschli overwhelmed twenty-three twenty-three he considers hmm swiftly making up his mind 
in that case major petkoff i beg to propose formally to become a suitor of your daughter's hand in place of major saranoff retired raina you dare bluntly if you were twenty-three when you said those things to me this afternoon i shall take them seriously catherine loftily polite i doubt sir whether you quite realize either my daughter's position or that of major sergius saranoff whose place you propose to take the petkoffs and the saranoffs are known as the richest and most important families in the country our position is almost historical we can go back nearly twenty years petkoff oh never mind that catherine to bluntschli we should be most happy bluntschli if it were only a question of your position but hang it you know raina is accustomed to a very comfortable establishment sergius keeps twenty horses bluntschli but what on earth is the use of twenty horses why it's a circus catherine severely my daughter sir is accustomed to a first-rate stable raina hush mother you're making me ridiculous Blanchley. oh well if it comes to a question of an establishment here goes he goes impetuously to the table and seizes the papers in the blue envelope uh, how many horses did you say sergius twenty noble switzer Blanchley. i have two hundred horses they are amazed how many carriages sergius three Blanchley. i have seventy Twenty-four of them will hold twelve inside, besides two on the box, without counting the driver and conductor. How many tablecloths have you? Sergius, how the deuce do I know? Bluntschli, have you four thousand? Sergius, no. Bluntschli, I have. I have nine thousand six hundred pairs of sheets and blankets, with two thousand four hundred eider-down quilts i have ten thousand knives and forks and the same quantity of dessert spoons i have six hundred servants i have six palatial establishments besides two livery stables a tea garden and a private house i have four medals for distinguished services i have the rank of an officer and the standing of a gentleman and i have three native languages show me any man in bulgaria that can offer as much Petkoff, with childish awe, are you Emperor of Switzerland? Bluntschli, my rank is the highest known in Switzerland. I'm a free citizen. Catherine, then, Captain Bluntschli, since you are my daughter's choice, I shall not stand in the way of her happiness. Petkoff is about to speak. That is Major Petkoff's feeling also. Petkoff, oh, I shall be only too glad. Two hundred horses! Phew! Sergius. What says the lady? Raina, pretending to sulk. The lady says that he can keep his tablecloths and his omnibuses. I am not here to be sold to the highest bidder. Bluntschli. I won't take that answer. I appeal to you as a fugitive, a beggar, and a starving man. You accepted me you gave me your hand to kiss your bed to sleep in and your roof to shelter me raina interrupting him i did not give them to the emperor of switzerland bluntschli that's just what i say he catches her hand quickly and looks her straight in the face as he adds with confident mastery now tell us who you did give them to raina succumbing with a shy smile to my chocolate cream soldier bluntschli with a boyish laugh of delight that'll do thank you looks at his watch and suddenly becomes businesslike time's up major you've managed those regiments so well that you are sure to be asked to get rid of some of the infantry of the timok division send them home by way of lompalanka saranoff don't get married until i come back I shall be here punctually at five in the evening on Tuesday fortnight. Gracious ladies, good evening. He makes them a military bow and goes. Sergius. What a man! What a man! 
End of Act Three. End of Arms and the Man by George Bernard Shaw. This recording by Phil Chenevere, August 2017, Baton Rouge, Louisiana.